The Gospel of Matthew, part two. We serve a merciful God. He's gracious and he's loving and understanding. And yet he provides for us everything that's needed. So we, our lives are enriched and filled of his goodness. We go into the continued part two of the Gospel of Matthew. And I pray that as we have concluded part one, the Gospel of Matthew, that you are blessed. And as we go into the teachings of part two, I pray that the Holy Spirit will again minister and allow you to be receptive to the Word of God. Your life will be enriched in your family and your faith will continue to increase, especially your prayer life as you continue to see God's face and His heart and we give Him thanks right now. Faith believing everything else will fail. That God's word will forever stand. Be blessed in the teachings. The Gospel of Matthew, part two. In part two of the exploring the Gospel of Matthew, we'll cover chapters 11 through 28. We cover the origins of Matthew in chapters 1 to 10 in part one, which left off where Jesus commissioned the disciples. This was the end of the second book in the structure of Matthew. And if you remember the structure of Matthew, we had a prologue from chapters 1 through 2.23. The first book from 3.1 to 7.29, which was the law and its right interpretation. The prologue being the genealogy and infancy narrative. Book two was from chapter eight through 11, verse one, Jesus heals and commissions to heal. And then book three is um, from chapter 11, verse two to 13.53, which uh, looks at Jesus and the confrontation of contemporary religiosity with a discourse of the parables of the kingdom. Book four from 1354 to 191, the manifestation of Jesus' identity and its implication of service, with a discourse on the childlike character of those who receive the kingdom. Book five from chapter 19, verse two to 26, one, which is the last days in the final judgment, with a discourse on the judgment to come, often called the Olivet Discourse, and the conclusion uh, from 26, two through to 28, 20, which is the crucifixion, resurrection, and commission. So the beginning of part two of the book of Matthew, we open chapter 11, where Jesus goes on to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. And when John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subject to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed, because they did not repent. At that time, Jesus said, All things have been committed to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Chapter 12 recounts disputes between Jesus and the Pharisees about the Sabbath, about where he got the power to heal. The Pharisees accused him of getting it from Satan. The Pharisees wanted Jesus to show them a sign, but Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
Well, Jonah was three days, uh, three nights in the belly of a huge fish. So the Son of Man will be three days, uh, three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh will stand up at, a, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The chapter ends with Jesus' mother and brothers outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. In chapter 13, Jesus tells the parable of the sower, of the weeds, mustard seed and yeast, hidden treasure in the net. Each one starts with, the kingdom of heaven is like. The parables tell of the kingdom of God, which will sift people in the last days, punishing the sinners and rewarding the righteous. Though the kingdom of God has such great benefits, the people should be prepared to give up everything to attain it. Though the kingdom starts from small beginnings and expands to fill up the world. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. That is why I speak to them in parables. The chapter finishes with Jesus being questioned in his hometown. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Chapters 14 to 16 shadow mark. Chapter 14 covers the execution of John the Baptist by Herod, the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. Chapter 15 is the discussion of what is clean and unclean. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth that is what defies them. This is followed by the story of the faith of the Canaanite woman, telling Jesus that even the dogs under the table get to eat the children's crumbs and is commended for her faith. The feeding of the 4,000 ends the chapter. In chapter 16, the Pharisees again ask for a sign and again are told the only sign they will get will be the sign of Jonah. Jesus asks his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And in Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answers, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain a whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. 
There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well. Please listen to him. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. When the disciples fail to heal a boy with a demon, Jesus tells them it's because they have little faith. He tells them again he will be betrayed, killed and raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus then teaches the disciples through further parables. The parable of the lost sheep telling the disciples and us that God will drop everything to seek the one lost sheep out of a hundred, that lost one being us. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. In his teaching to the Pharisees about divorce, Jesus extends the principle of law by saying, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. All these I've kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go to the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In chapter 20, Jesus predicts his death one more time, when the mother of James and John requests that they sit either side of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus responds that she does not know what she's asking, but it's not up to him to determine who sits at his side. Jesus calls the disciples together and says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, Lord, is over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 21 starts the account of what is known as Passion Week in the Gospel of Matthew. The three signs we see in Matthew 21, the entry on the donkey, the symbolic cleansing of the temple, and the cursing of the fig tree, present Jesus as a prophetic sage, like but greater than Solomon, as Jesus announces the end of the corrupt temple and the beginning of the eschatological age. Chapter 21 verses, This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet, Say to Z daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus was presenting himself as a king. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus again criticizes the temple leaders as he cleans the temple. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The cursing of the fig tree depicts the coming judgment on unfruitful Israel. 
The chief priests questioned Jesus' authority to do these things, but Jesus traps them by asking where John the Baptist's authority came from. They refuse to answer, as it will either incriminate them for not listening to John or upset those who follow John. Jesus then refuses to answer them, but then tells the parables of good and bad sons, the tenants and guests at the wedding banquet, which all criticise the religious authorities. He finally asks them in chapter 22, verse 42. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. Jesus said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. In Matthew 23, Jesus once again criticizes the religious establishment. And Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. For they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, common stones, loads, and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Woe to you, teachers of the laws and the Pharisees. You hypocrites, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's face. You yourself do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth. Truly I tell you, all this will come on this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Chapters 24 and 25 recount the Mount Olivet discourse to the disciples. Jesus tells the disciples that all the stones of the temple will be thrown down and they ask, when will this happen? Jesus answers, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, for the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus warns there will be many false messiahs, but there will be no mistaking his return. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other only the father knows when this will be but jesus warns us through the parable of the sheep and the goats and the ten virgins that we must be ready for his return we will be judged for how we help the poor and needy for as we help them we do it unto him the final events of Passion Week are covered in more detail in our teaching on Passion Week. In Matthew chapter 26, we see Judas agreed to betray Jesus to the chief priests for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is then anointed by the woman with an alabaster box, and the Last Supper takes place as Jerusalem prepares to celebrate Passover. Jesus tells the disciples that one of them will betray him. In chapter 26, verse 26, we read, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the wine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, This very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. After praying in Gethsemane for the cup to be removed, but accepting what the Father's will is, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss and Jesus is arrested, saying that although he could call on legions of angels to save him, scripture must be fulfilled. The trial before the Sanhedrin is going nowhere until the high priest asks if Jesus is the Christ, to which Jesus replies, It is as you say. The disciples have fled and Peter's disowned Jesus three times as predicted. Judas kills himself after returning the 30 pieces of silver, the money he was used to buy the potter's field as a burial place, thus fulfilling a prophecy of Jeremiah. Jesus is taken before Pilate, who is the power to sentence Jesus to death. Despite warnings from Pilate's wife, an attempt to give Jesus a Passover pardon and no evidence against Jesus, Pilate condemns Jesus to death, washing his hands of the guilt of Jesus' death. Jesus is flogged and handed over to be crucified. Soldiers mock Jesus, beat him and give him a crown of thorns. Sound of Cyrene is pulled from the crowd to carry the cross as Jesus is taken to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And in chapter 27 we read that there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it he refused to drink it. And when the soldiers had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The curtain of the temple is torn in two. Matthew notes that women were watching from a distance and that they followed Joseph of Arathamea as he buried Jesus in his tomb, having gotten permission from Pilate. Pilate orders the tomb to be guarded so that the body cannot be stolen. Now early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to the tomb, but they find the stone at the entrance rolled back and an angel sitting on it. The guards were like dead men. Matthew 28, 5, we read, The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Matthew's verse 8 echoes Mark's. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, but now the verse finishes. Yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There 
they will see me. The guards are bribed to say they fell asleep and the body was stolen, an offence that could have had them executed. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Conclusion to the book of Matthew. Not without reason has the book of Matthew been called the greatest story ever told. Matthew skillfully tells the story of Jesus' life and teachings interweaving it with the numerous fulfillments of prophecy, bringing Old and New Testaments into one complete story. Jesus is critical of the religious establishment and the self-righteous, but never the people. A lesson we need to remember and apply today. We need to remember that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and it's only by accepting Jesus as Lord and Saviour of our lives will we avoid being separated as goats from the sheep for punishment. Salvation is a gift from God that we have to accept for it to be effective. And we can accept it, and you can accept it by praying this prayer. And if you'd like to do it, then pray this prayer with us. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I'm a sinner and I'm a sorry for my sins and the life that I've lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe that your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins. And now I'm willing to turn from my sin. You said in the Bible that we've confessed the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. We shall be saved. Right now I confess Jesus as my Lord. With my heart I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Saviour. And according to his word, right now I am saved. Amen. Amen. And so now that we have come to the conclusion of the book of the Gospel of Matthew, the second half, it is truly the greatest story ever told and a demonstration of God's love for each and every one of us. And he loves us all the same. Yet in the, the second part of the book of the Gospel of Matthew, here in Jesus gave specific instructions and declaring the word, which is God, which is truth and life. The assurance that it's no matter what they're facing, that he's with them always. He knows the he knows our heart because that's that's what God looks at. And Jesus examines our heart and no matter what we're saying, but yet he is still willing that we come to repentance. Repentance of things that we say one thing with our mouth, but deep within ourselves we're saying something else. He's a God of all seeing, he hears everything. And he knows everything. So what's that saying to us today? Let's examine ourselves. Let's present ourselves to God and ask him to allow his spirit to guide and to teach us everything we ought to say and we, what we ought to do. And we must be mindful that only God is perfect. But he loves us all the same. And although we are imperfect, we continue to seek his face in his heart. He perfects us and the things that concerns us and his desire for our faith to increase and always be mindful and acknowledge that it's not in our natural strength we're able to accomplish anything but only in his strength. He said, ask and you will receive. Knock and the door shall be open. How are we to receive if we're not asking? How are we to knock and respect the door to open? And yet God wants to fulfill everything. He wants us to be submissive to his will and not our will. That's the ultimate goal right there. And again, he says, heaven and earth will pass away but my word will forever stand. And in our daily lives, 
let's make it our responsibility to present ourselves to be cleansed of every unrighteousness, every uncleanness. So day after day, we become more like Christ. We become more a vessel of righteousness and holiness. So we truly be the ambassadors that we're called to be. And especially for those that are in strategic places. So we will truly represent Jesus who had done many things and only good things. We also done it mostly because of God's will to be accomplished. And let us have that desire. God's will to be accomplished in our lives, not our will. And it's not an overnight process. It's an ongoing process. And God is well able to complete what he starts in us. But yet at the same time, he's looking for us to continue to seek him, seek his face and his heart. So we will truly be the light in the midst of the darkness, which is even right now, that is so evident in the world. And if God is for you, who could be against you? Because God is a continuous shield around his people. And he is a defender of his word. The word itself will always bring glory to God. We want to give God thanks for a God of provision. He's a God of peace. The God of righteousness. God of holiness. A loving God. He's a God of forgiveness. Because no matter what it is, God says, I'm well able. I am God and besides me, there's none else. So I bless and I praise, I give God thanks for again privilege to come before him, to lift up the name of Jesus, who is the gateway and his sweet spirit, the one that continues to teach, guide and direct the way we should go and what we should do for the glory of God. We should truly know that only the only thing and everything that is done for the Lord will last. Everything else will fail. Continue to stay focused and be blessed with his word. Continue to look unto him, the author and the finisher of your faith. And let God be glorified in your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.